There's uh, so much to say, and we get one more opportunity uh, to listen and learn and, uh, uh, and extract some more wisdom from our three keynote speakers who I'd like to invite up on the stage now and take a seat in, in front of uh, one of the microphones. Um, I'm going to give each keynote speaker a time to reflect on what they may have heard at this summit. You know, what did they learn and uh, what have they heard that uh, could help us learn some more. So, Raj, Smita, and Claire, that's a bright light up there. And then, uh, after they each give their five minute uh, kind of summary, uh, of what they've heard and learned and what we might be able to learn from them. Um, we have two microphones, one to the left and one to the right, and I'll just keep alternating uh, until we run out of people to have questions or run out of time. So, and we're going to end on time. So, um, with that, um, would anyone uh, like to volunteer to go first um, so that we don't uh, set up uh, any particular order? So, Claire, Smitter, or Raj, or do you want me to pick somebody? I'll start with Raj since he was the last one today. You get the first. Doug, that's a bad package. choice. I didn't know we had to prepare anything. So you didn't I'm, have I'm... to prepare anything. Just off the top of your mind. <laughs> okay, Smitty, you're ready. Okay, guys, just the five, just what what's your impressions? Just have what been our impressions and, are. Okay. Yep. Hi everyone. Hi. <laughs> Hello. I haven't heard from you. So say that again. Hello. Hello. Okay. Just a reminder that there are many, many voices in this room. So, okay, five minutes of reflection. I'll start by saying I'm, I've been so impressed at the levels at which we've been having this conversation. There's so many planes literally coming in from outer space and then going down, 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 and then right into the soil, right? And right into push-pull, which I just loved. Um, and I've really enjoyed thinking about food systems in two ways as we do that. One is, one is the abuses of our current system. And as we went through all those levels and planes, through all the examples, all I could think about is that our current industrial agricultural food system does such, comes, our food comes to us by way of great violence to the planet, to the ecosystem, to the people who produce it, and then it does such violence to our bodies, right? So the idea of sort of the safety of the food has come up a lot, nutrition, what is it doing to our cells? What's it doing to our bodies? And Jamie and others also talked about what's it, what's it doing to our social fabric? So it's actually breaking us down on all these levels. And then we had all these wonderful examples of how food can regenerate make us more resilient, make us more united, make us more organized, involve us in struggle. And the examples coming from Malawi, the examples coming from, um, coming from uh, Johannesburg, from, from Costa Rica, from Nicaragua, they're sort of examples of, of things that are possible even in moments of incredible structural violence, right? And that to me renews a lot of optimism about why food is an entry point to talk about so many of the things that we care about and that connect so many of us in this room. The, the piece about the abuse, I also just want to say, I'm, I'm also thankful for the reminder for myself that we're not just talking about land but our oceans and Anastasia brought that home with the discussion of sort of fisheries and that we're also, Annie talked about, we're also talking about um, pastoralists and we're talking about fisher folk, we're talking about indigenous communities. Um, we have the small farmer as a reference, as a place to go for many of us. It's the, it's the work we've done, it's who's in this room, but to remind us that food producers are about a lot more than that. And then there's a reminder that the food producers, are, it's also about labor and it's about bringing labor into the conversation, including into this room. And I, I think about, you know, I'm thinking about future summits or, or future gatherings. Can we have a panel where we have migrant farm workers sitting up here telling us what we need to be doing to be their allies? Can we have a conversation where we have people who are food insecure tell us what it feels like to be food insecure and what they see as the strategies and their struggles and how we can be allies? Can we, can we um, listen to them instead of talking about them? And <laughs> Um, 
I'll say that one of the ways in which, which listening to them will illuminate a lot of things, some of the things that we've talked about are about structural issues, and that came up in a lot of the presentations, both in terms of how structural issues are an, a great obstacle to implementation of human rights law that came up in Nadia's presentation and others. And then there were also questions, and Raphael and others talked about the structure, um, the structure of the rules of global economic governance, you know, structural adjustment programs um, and others. And to understand that, you know, Raj took us on this journey of like going back to our colonial food regime and the idea of food regimes, if you want to understand food as a regime and as a means of governance, then read Harriet Friedman, read Philip McMichael's seminal work on food regimes and go from our, our current food system is sort of this great grandchild of our colonial food regime and it's been enabled by all these structural things like structural adjustment programs, um, the servicing of unfair debt, um, you know, unfair trade rules and, and free trade, so-called free trade agreements and now land grabbing. And somebody was asking about TPP and is it going to affect the right to food. Again, if you want to know the impact of trade agreements on the right to food and on the rights of farmers, you just need to um, start talking to migrant farm workers here in Vermont and elsewhere who are here because NAFTA destroyed their livelihoods and, and, and sent them from becoming farmers into laborers and we don't even recognize them as farmers. These are farmers that our system abused and disrespected and they were pushed out of their homes and they are now food insecure laborers on our farms. They should be here, they should be in the conversation. Um, the um, the then I you know the last thing that I sort of come up with and and or that you've all made me think about so much and that I think we all want to leave here with is how can we be allies in the struggle? What can we do? Well, the first thing is that you're all doing so much already. I'm I am amazed by the presentations we've seen. I'm amazed by the conversations that we've had. I'm amazed at the different ways that we've already seen how people are disrupting the design. Right? I mean, having food. Um, be offered in a doctor's office from a healthcare share for people who can't afford it. That's a very disruptive idea and it's a very powerful, regenerative, sort of resilient idea. Um, and then we also have visions, right? So we need to have visionaries put out visions of what, what are we going towards. We have a lot of ideas of this is the hell that we're all going into, but we don't have a vi these visions of this is what it could look like. And I really appreciated Ellen's presentation because it was like, this is a, this is a model of where we could go. And then you can find yourself in it because you see like, we're gonna need this many more farmers. And I'm like, all right, that's go. I can work on that. Or we're gonna need to reduce our consumption greatly. Okay, that's a contribution that I can make. So I really applaud the idea of not just, of actually imagining and envisioning um, these alternative futures and pull yourself into a transformative space to do that because it's a tool. It helps us all get there. And then finally, um, I would talk, you know, Claire, you had this wonderful graph that just showed inequity in terms of consumption, the high income countries, how much they're consuming. Reducing our consumption is an act of of um, it's an act of solidarity, and and really and reducing it, and I'm working on this myself in a way that's actually inconvenient, right? Like there's a lot of ways in which we can reduce it in ways that are sort of greenwashing what we're doing, but ways that really force us to make a paradigm shift in our own lives, in how we live, in a daily on a daily basis, even as we ask all these institutions and systems and corporations to make a paradigm shift in theirs. Um, and finally, um, you know, walk out of here committing yourself to maybe doing, um, doing just one thing. You've learned about all these struggles, fight for 15, migrant justice, Black Lives Matter. You've, you've learned about, you're starting to think about TPP now. I can see you starting to think about it. Um, and, and commit yourself to just learning about, learning about one struggle um, and then going and asking, reaching out to that struggle and asking how you can be an ally and then take steps to do it and then commit to gathering yourselves, all whoever's here, you know, form a little community amongst yourselves and do what Raj told us to do, like have joy and food in organizing, but please center the voices of those um, whose voices really need to be heard. But I want us all to leave here ready to think more critically, be pulled into transformative spaces and not feel paralyzed by the enormity of this, but to really be prepared to act. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Claire, do you have some comments? Wow. You want me 
to follow that. <laughs> I'm just going to applaud what Smita said because, I mean, she has uh, a gift, I think, for synthesizing um, and uh, as well, you know, not only for synthesizing, but also for her own in incisive thoughts that started the conference off. And she's done just such a brilliant job just now of bringing everything together. Um, I don't believe in saying more words if, not, if more words aren't needed. So I'm gonna rest with what she said. I thought it was amazing. <laughs> Raj, do you have anything to add? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, really, I mean, the, 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 we started, we started uh, the, uh, I, I winged in late in the middle of a, a, an amazing conversation with the leadership group around allyship and accountability. And th that, it seems to me, is the question that we've been asking ourselves, like, well, we, we see ourselves in this movement, and where do we see ourselves in this movement? How, how are we connected, and how... How do we be allies? And uh, what I love about what Smith just said is exactly that we need to find the people to whom we need to be accountable. Um, you know, the, the places where we get to surrender our privilege, where we you know get, get to uh, put ourselves in service of other people in ways that they can then hold us accountable. And finding those communities, and then you know, I mean, it, it, Marxism isn't great at finding good terms for things like class suicide, for example. That's that's, that's, that's not a it's, it's, it's not a term that's, that, that's great, but the idea is ultimately that you, you, you don't want, I mean, we want to live in a world without, you know, this, this class exploitation. We want to live in a world without white supremacy. I mean, we, we, we want to live in those worlds, but if we're serious about that stuff, then finding those communities and putting our privilege and sacrificing our privilege so that no one has it over anyone else uh, is surely what we need to be doing in the food movement. And those really concrete steps, as Smith just said, seem to me exactly the ones that we need to be doing. So thank you. So now you have the responsibility and the right and the opportunity uh, to come up to one of the two microphones and um, ask um, the questions you uh, may have uh, presented earlier on the cards or you've come up with a new one since uh, uh, listening to uh, more of the presenters. So please line up at the microphone so we can go quickly through. And we'll start with uh, the microphone on my right, um, because you're there first. Okay. Thank you. So um, my question is specifically for Smita, but um, if I may, I just want to frame it with a quick quote, because I think it's important. Um, my generation is a generation, I fear, of great talkers, overly fond of conferences. On action, however, we have fallen far short. And that's by James Speth. Um, but I just had a question. Um, so. How has your activist title and work informed what you do? And then also for those of us in the room that might be a little bit hesitant to take on the title or the role of activist, what would you recommend um, for us to do in order to be comfortable with that? Because I think that's an incredibly important piece of this work is to really focus on the action and the community engagement piece of that. So I hope that was con concise and clear, but maybe not. <laughs> I don't think, um, I think it's a great question. And I don't think it's actually a matter of titles. I, that I could put and have put so many titles under my name trying to describe myself. I actually struggle with it. Sometimes it's, you know, a academic, um, advocate, attorney, activist. I have this split personality around how to actually describe myself. But I don't think it actually matters at the end of the day. I think, I think what matters for ourselves and for the, for the world, and this was yesterday, talking about going inwards and then also reaching out, is you need to define for yourself what you see as a community, a space in which you want to live, right? And then you need to look around and figure out, is what I'm seeing close to my vision and close to who I am? And then you need to find a way to make sure that whatever you do and wherever you are, and it gets difficult, it gets difficult depending on the spaces you're in, but wherever you are, that you always strive, if you can, 
to do things and say things that are to which you can hold yourself accountable? Are you, is what you're saying and what you're doing accountable to your moral sense of the world and how you should live in it? If you can hold yourself accountable to yourself, then it doesn't matter what title you're going to wear, but that's a process that's about finding out who you are in your place and then, and then acting with that, with that courage. And it takes that kind of courage to do it, but, but the courage is, um, if I, it, it, the courage is actually those who have really been beaten down and who've, whose every single day is a fight to survive, right? And we talked about this in one of the conversations yesterday. Their entire day is spent just trying to get from, from point A to point B, trying to get food on the table. Hunger is ground zero. I mean, you, they, if, if we are fortunate enough to have our, at least our, you know, our basic needs met, then what can we do what can we do with, with the courage of others and with the resilience you saw in all of these things to be able to at least live in a way where we can speak freely, right? I mean, that's what's being called upon us right now. We're not being asked to, or I don't know everybody in this room, I'm not being called upon to ask to make choices between having food and feeding, feeding my children or paying for rent or putting the heat on. I'm being called upon to, to speak up. And, and the people who are making those hard choices are speaking up. So I'm being called upon to listen to them and to amplify their voices. It feels like, an, it feels like a, an enormous step, but in the context of all the privilege and the comforts that I have, it is actually the least that I can do. Right. Okay, can I just, uh, I, I do want to celebrate those things to the fact that you do say activist, and that's important in a time where activists are kind of, I mean, when you hear the, the term on Fox News, which occasionally we, we all do, um, the, you know, it, it's activist, you know, it, it's, it, it has this, this sort of jagged edge to it, like, like you're, you're a bad person for speaking truth to power. And you speak truth to power, I mean, that's what we, that's what we try and do. I mean, that, and, and, and sometimes people, I mean, that, that, that's a language that I'm, I, I actually, I celebrate that you celebrate it. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's worth, it, it's worth finding that. I mean, you know, to, for, to, I mean, for, for me to, 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 to be an activist is just to be pissed off about something and find something unfair. Um, and if you if you find something unfair and you do something about it, you're an activist. And, if, and, and in, a, in a sense, if you find something unfair and you don't do something about it, you're complicit. Uh, and I think that's the that's the opposite of an activist. Uh, and and if, if that's how we define an activist, then I, I think you know that's that's a language that that we need to be embracing a bit. Well, I mean, uh, which, you, which you do embrace, so I just want to celebrate that you do that. Um, as Smita said that we need to have more farmers' voices being broadcasted. You know, we've all, everyone in here, I'm sure has been to a million conferences on agroecology absent from farmer input. And we see resilience and communities like the CAC movement, like the Malawi community. Um, but how, what kind of techniques are available to return farmers at the helm so agriculture stops becoming agribusiness and returns back to agriculture? What kind of techniques can do that on a global scale? Thank you. I think that we need to go to the farmers, we don't, you know, they're very busy people and so we need to go out to the farms and find out what they want um, rather than necessarily insisting that they have to come to another place because often that's just very difficult. Um, so I think if we, uh, we, we need to create dialogues and conversations and I think that this is happening in a lot of places. Uh, in different venues, and so I think we just, we need to do more of that. La, La, La Via Campesina is an organization founded because farmers were like, here, over here, here we, we have things to say, and the World Bank and a range of NGOs were like, I, sorry, mosquito, uh, you know, that through structural adjustment, uh, farmers' movements were saying, this is, this is not okay. You know, we, we, and they were organized, and there's the long histories of peasant movements in many of these countries uh, that, that, that constitute La Via Campesina. And 
they would were pissed at, at you know, the, their intelligence, their dignity, uh, their capacity for autonomy, their, their thought, um, their histories, their knowledge of agriculture, their culture, the, you know, the, all of that was being erased because people were like, if only we could find some farmers to consult with, and by consult with they mean agree to what it is we want to do. And of course, you know, the, when the World Bank comes in and says, you know, would, you, would, would you like us to eviscerate the farmer extension services and deny you credit, no one's going to agree to that. So the, you know, the World Bank never consulted with those farmers. Uh, and, and so I, th I think what's lovely about La Via Campesina is that they have the structures where, I think it's 250 million is the upper bound of members now. Um, you know, I've, I've, they, they, are, they have the power and they are uh, you know, speaking and theorizing and analyzing and being scientists uh, and being social scientists and being politicians and policy developers. Uh, the, the problem is to fight for space so that those voices are, are heard. Um, a number of times over the conference, we've, we've talked about uh, the issue of food as a commodity. And um, I thought I would ask the question, if, if we want to make food a right, can food still be a commodity? So food commodities are... are um it, or as people call it, food stuff. You know, all these other labels um, that we attach to food, like, or, or, or the opposite, organic food, slow food, things that just used to be called food and now have to have these other labels attached to it. So commodities is one of those labels, like pulling in the op opposite direction. It's actually, it's, it's not food, it's food stuff. There, there is an interesting idea out there and about treating food as a commons versus a commodity. And it's a paper written by... I'm so sorry. Thanks. Please shout out the name. Jose Viveropol, thank you very much. Um, but that's this idea of, of reconceptualizing our relationship to food and that it and to start treating it as a commons. And I think that's a that's a really important insertion into the conversation and a counter narrative to food as a commodity. Hi, thank you for, for your presentations and for your courage. Um, it's been very inspiring. Um, I'm, I'm new to this field, so, um, and, I, and I recognize that this is a, an, an androcentric conference, but I keep feeling like we are on the edge of talking about something that we're not talking about um, when we talk about even the right, the right to food and how, how we can feed the world and how we can maintain, how, how we can um, so, you know, address the climate crisis and how we can maintain human dignity. Um, and, and that is uh, the place of the non-human in this conversation. Um, and it just seems to me the elephant in the living room. So I'm wondering where, where you see the role of other, other beings in, in this conversation. Well, I, I see lots of roles for the non-human being because really, you know, the whole proposition of agriculture is impossible without those non-human beings. There are so many organisms that need to be uh, here on this planet for um, agriculture to work and for us to survive. And, and so that's really the meaning of ecosystem services. The fundament of those ecosystem services is biodiversity. Uh, without that biodiversity, we, we can't exist. And so... We have to be thinking, you know, that is really the, the basis for environment, the environmental component of sustainability. Um, I think where we get into more trouble is that um, when we do agriculture, we are massively modifying ecosystems, whether it's sustainable agriculture or industrial agriculture. In both cases, we're massively modifying natural ecosystems, and there are certainly um, a large component of the biodiversity out there that cannot really live um, in an ag agro-ecosystem. Uh, so it's, it's really for that reason that when we do consider the non-human biodiversity in, uh, on land or, or in the oceans, uh, we have to think about also protecting some spaces that are really just for nature to the extent that we can, because we also have to recognize that um, through our actions as humans, um, even when we make set-asides, for example, of land for nature or uh, of 
regions in the sea for nature, our influence is completely pervasive at this point through climate change, through invasive species and other things so that we can't, we can't control the, those processes don't respect the borders that we might set up. So um, to consider the non-human biodiversity, we need, we need to think about it specifically, what can we do to care for that, uh, bio, to care for biodiversity. Uh, but I think that a, a sustainable agriculture is critical because it recognizes the reliance on biodiversity and it can also be a much more um, friendly and purposeful way of preserving some, of conserving some elements of biodiversity in uh, what we might call our working landscapes. Does anyone else like to add anything? Next question. Thank you. So this question is slightly similar, uh, part of it. Um, the first one is, where do you see specifically animal rights? Could you get right in yes. front of the Sorry. microphone? Sorry. Oh. Thank you. So this question is slightly similar uh, to the last one. The first part is, where do you see animal rights um, playing a role in this system? Um, and it's not just about diversity, but it's actually the animals we eat. And the other part of this is, do you see governments taking an active role in influencing food choices uh, when we have about 40% of the rainforests in Brazil deforested for grazing and feed. So kind of where do you see those two things? Rosh? I mean, governments already actively influence our food choices. I mean, the, the, if, if the environmental costs of that McDonald's burger were, were included in the, uh, and, and the environmental and social costs were included in the price, it would be nearer $200, right? I mean, that, that was the, the, the valuation of uh, a group uh, at the, uh, called the Center for Sci Science and Environment in India. Um, so by, by merely allowing uh, the, the, this distorted system of you know, gifts to large corporations and you know, not, not needing to, to clean up the, the environmental damage caused by the industry, you know, particularly the meatification of diets, um, governments already take a position on what it is that we eat. Uh, so the, the, the question is, what do we, what, what do we want them to do? Um, if I can rephrase, I mean, what not to eat. So when, do you think they will eventually say, you cannot eat meat anymore, or other products that have such an environmental cost? So just for clarification. Yeah, I, and, but, but I, I guess we'll, I was g g heading in, in, in the direction of saying, well, um, you know, there's an interesting public health angle here where the, the, the analogy is with uh, tobacco, um, where... Uh, Governments do take a position on uh, you know, issues around tobacco, and I mean, at, at the end of the day, that there's a, a sort of radical position that, that says actually there shouldn't be tobacco companies. Um, I mean, if people want to grow their own tobacco and cure it and smoke it themselves, that's great. But you shouldn't allow corporations that, that sell things that are designed to kill you. Like, that's just, you know, I mean, other than the arms industry, of course. Uh, so you know, you, you have this, uh, you know, the, the, this idea that you, you should abolish the, the, the tobacco industry. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 you're already seeing things like the Mexican soda tax, um, where governments are uh, taking sort of positions on what it is that you're, uh, you know, the, the, the price of what it is you're allowed to do. In, in um, California, we had the foie gras ban. Um, so, you know, absolutely saying you, that this is cruel and, and uh, unusual and you, sh you shouldn't be able to eat it. Um, and, and I think that there, there is a, a, a role for the animal rights movement here. Um, and I think what's interesting about it is that I, what I'd like is sort of the militant uh, animal rights movement to, to, to come together with the farmers movement. Because I, I think what, what unites them is a sense of compassion. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, it's very clear to me that we need to be you know, you know, eating less, everyone needs to be eating less meat and heading towards a, you know, a zero meat and vegan diet. Um, but often with veganism, what, what I see the sort of crazy militancy and um, you know, there's, there's more sort of care for brown-eyed animals than brown-eyed people. You know, the, the, the labor question never enters into it, but, the, you know, but, but the, the, those animals, the, the poor things, they're, they're, they're suffering. And what, what I'd like to, you know, to, to have is this sort of unity of love, of understanding that actually the food system is, is ridden with suffering, uh, and you know, having uh, that idea is, is important. And I also just wanted to bridge what Claire was saying, which is, Actually, if we're honest about uh, agroecology and humans' place in the world, then th there is going to be, you know, the, the, our, I mean, our, our food system is about food for humans. It needs to be androcentric at some level. A, a friend of mine is a gardener, and I, you know, he, he told me that the Hindu god of gardening is Shiva, god of death. 
and, and, and the reason it's Shiva God of Death is because it, it, the minute you engage in, in farming, in agriculture, in gardening, you are deciding what lives and what doesn't, and the balance of what lives and what doesn't. And you be honest about that, and then all of a sudden you, you're, you're in a better place to start talking about animal rights and humans' rights and uh, you know, uh, the, the circles of life in which they, they, they move. Just uh, the last two questions, I think, are, are, are putting something really important on the table, which is we're talking about protecting nature and animals um, as, as, an, as, an, as a sort of instrumental function to protecting ourselves, right? That these things are still being instrumentalized in order to feed humans, right? That's, um, and, and that's incredibly, that's actually an incredibly important thing, but it's not a conversation about how to respect nature for nature, how to respect non-human, the, the entirety of non-human life on this planet, right? And that's, uh, um, the conversation uh, is, Im is importantly about how do we sustainably, how do we sustainably drain those resources for ourselves as opposed to how do we actually live in a way that understands that, that we have occupied this role of supremacy that is very destructive and, and, and you can't have, animals aren't in this room speaking up for their rights and, and Mother Nature is not in this room speaking up for her rights. Um, but there are people working on that. There, there's actually a, a declaration that's been put forth called the rights of Mother Nature or Mother Earth, the rights of, uh, which one is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, it's worth looking at that as, as a way of shifting, also shifting paradigms and shifting our minds of that, you know, Right now, humans are the sun around which the whole ecosystem evolves in, on planet Earth. And so how do we, how do we reorient that? Because it, that reorientation is actually necessary. Yeah. Um, Raj, you talked about the business and science um, feeding the world approach. And I think a lot of us in this room understand what's wrong with that and have heard critiques of it before. Um, but how would you suggest teaching the average consumer not uh, how to understand what's wrong with that approach. Um, th th there's, there's a number of ways in which a lot of people come to the food movement. Um, sometimes it's, you know, you, you read uh, Eric Schlosser or Michael Pollan, or you, maybe you see Food Inc. Uh, maybe uh, you uh, have, you know, you've seen one too many family members succ succumb to uh, Disease. Maybe you've uh, you've uh, you know, just had a joyful meal. Again, you know the the, the idea of um, moving beyond business and science and uh, uh, actually in, engaging in, in lovely food. It's a, it's a great recruiting tool. I mean, you know, getting around a, a, a dinner table. If, if, actually, you know, here's, here's a re really concrete um, thing to do: is to ask whoever it is that you're trying to persuade about their favorite meal, and. Usually that, you know, the, their all-time favorite meal will involve people they love and the food was great and it wasn't necessarily sitting around McDonald's, you know, eating McDonald's with one hand and, you know, texting with the other. Um, but it's, it, it is in fact about a, a community that's formed around respecting the food and respecting the people uh, around you. There's, there's something exciting about that. Uh, and one of, the, one of the places I've seen this practice in a really interesting way is with Bram Ahmadi's uh, approach to community organizing in Oakland. Uh, Brahm uh, helped set up something called uh, the, uh, the People's Grocery, uh, and now he's working on something called the People's Community Market. And w when he's organizing, particularly uh, among young people who have, you know, have maybe not, not such a great connection to the, 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 uh, the, the food system, he doesn't say, let's talk about food. He, he begins with, tell me who you love. And people, you know, say, oh, well, I love my grandma, I love my, you know, my, my uncle, and it's, so how are they doing? Oh, they're doing okay, you know, really? Well, you know, I mean, it's, you know, we, we take her down the clinic uh, twice a week or three times a week for dialysis, and, you know, it's, sometimes it's tough because, uh, you know, the, the welfare doesn't cover, cover everything. And right there, you're, you're in a conversation not about uh, business and nutrition, but you're in a conversation about love and social systems. And you, you, so by starting with love and getting to actually real human relations, you get that, to transform that conversation in a way that's much more kind of engaged than if you say, you consumer, let's turn this packet around and go ingredient to ingredient by ingredient, which you could do. I mean, and, and sometimes I do that and just say, look, this stuff's completely mysterious. You have no idea what it is. And people will be like, I don't care, it tastes great. Uh, but whereas if you start with love, you end up with in, in a place and with a, with a readiness to make transformation that's much more visceral and much less intellectual. And I think that that's, I mean, 
that, that, I mean, that's how business works, right? When they advertise things on TV, it's about, you know, sort of sex and wonderfulness and, uh, and gorgeousness and everything's fresh and fantastic. It's not about, uh, it, it, it's not going for an intellectual approach. And I think if we're going to use, if we're going to transform that, then using love and using our deep capacity for sympathy and for engagement, that, 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 that's a much more powerful weapon than reading a list of ingredients. Thank you. Hi, sorry, I also have another right question. Right in front of the microphone. Okay, this, the, yeah, okay. Um, my question is also for Raj, but I'm sure you, the both of you can contribute as well. Um, but so what I got from your talk was that um, community work and conversations um, are really the pivotal point of creating some sort of success. And um, it seems like the, the model that was implemented in the Malawi communities um, is, could be easily translated to an education environment, specifically college or like liberal arts college where interdisciplinary or whatever is like the buzzword um, for everything. <laughs> so what, like, what do you think like that translation could be and whether it should be encouraged um, and maybe for the, the rest of you, like what are your takes on how we should be bringing these sort of situations where I'm probably on the younger side of the spectrum here, but like, how do we bring these issues to a younger generation? I'll be quick. It, 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 there is a framework for it. It's participatory action research. Uh, and the idea there is that um, everyone is a social scientist. The, the, the participatory action research has this critique of what the wacky political scientists do, which is political science pretends that politics is a science. And uh, right there, there's the problem because they pretend that you can have these two com comparison cases and you know, compare one thing to another and hold these other variables constant and it's nuts. Uh, but what participatory action research says is actually better science is try and change the world and see what happens. Uh, perform an experiment. That's, that's why the term experiments is, is sort of central to, to this Malawi story. But almost everything that we're interested in is an experiment. All the wonderful things that we've seen here are experiments. They're uh, real, uh, you know, people taking very seriously, very scientific approaches of what are the variables here, how do we tweak them, how do we move forward? Uh, and, I mean, the, so, yeah, the, 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 it does exist. Participatory action research is one example, but there are many others. Next question. Oh, yeah. Well, I just want to say, am I on? Yeah. Uh, that I thought the Malawi example is incredibly inspiring, and, um, that I think that we need, uh, you know, to, to bounce off what Raj has said about participatory act, action research, that this is really uh, a fundamental and great approach that could be spread out, um, you know, because the problems that we have in um, food systems or in um, developing an agroecological system that's going to work are so context specific. They're context specific to the ecology, to the geography, to the crop systems that are being produced and to the specific social issues and gender relations that are in a, any given place. And so I think that um, that that was a beautiful example of, you know, a, te a technique, and I didn't actually even realize that that was the technique that was being used, but it makes a lot of sense, that could just be um, something that could be happening in, in, in all of these specific localities that can really adapt to the needs of those particular places. 